good evening. Yeah, no, uh, we we'll start by uh, thank you, sir. We we'll start by looking at the issue of zoning. Uh, heading to 2020, zoning has become very topical in uh, national politics. Some are agitating that uh, the president should be zoned to the south. Do you share that view, or what's your take on that? Generally, at the eve of every election season, particularly general elections, interests will come into play as to who gets what and what will be where. Uh, zoning, as far as some of us are concerned, is between a north and a south divide. That's the understanding of zoning. And President Buhari is about completing his eight years from the north. So the expectation of every Nigerian is that the South is going to produce the next president for another eight years. That is the expectation. For where in the South it will go is a different ball game. But the essence of zoning is to ensure participation, inclusiveness, you know, of all and sundry, no matter where you come from, that constitutes the geographical expression we refer to as Nigeria. And it brings about peace, unity, you know, and love. If all participates in the management of the national cake, it will bring about a lot more unity and peace. And that is the purpose for which principle of zoning, that understanding was brought to play, or brought to bear by our leaders who took that decision in the interest of the entire nation. So in 2023, the expectation is that the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, in whichever party is elected, is going to come from the southern region. So if you look at even the majority parties, uh, particularly the leading two parties, PDP and APC, it's very clear that they are all having their national chairman from the northern region. That is one indication that that zoning understanding of south north is certainly come, going to come to play. So, if the party chairman are coming from the north or have been elected from the north, then the presidential candidates will come from the south. In whatever diction people are describing the situation, it is only to say because of what we are suffering today in the hands of President Buhari and the APC, mm -hmm. people expect that we need a president who has the capacity, the knowledge and the competence to lead Nigeria in the right direction. Not in this way that the APC and President Buhari has rubbished Nigeria, a country that had earned world respect and recognition over time, had now become the poverty capital of the world. From the leading economy of Africa to a place that has been ravaged by insecurity when a retired general could not manage the insecurity situation that was better managed by President Goodluck, you know, so on and so forth. So I think that the uh, issue of having the Saddam president in 2023 is surely going to be realized for the betterment peace, unity, progress, and inclusiveness of all parts of this country to enhance that desired 
participation of all. I, I do have ways, uh, if your party PDP is uh, doing that line of action to get the president from the south. Well, I had said that the PDP elected their national chairman from the north. That is a clear indication that our presidential candidate, when the time for zoning comes on which part of this country will produce the presidential candidate of PDP, it will be zoned to the south because the north already has a national channel. The Electoral Act to have become so controversial, you know, as a matter of fact, the President eventually declared the asset. What's the portion of this vis-a-vis -vis your standing at the National Assembly? For some of us, we had from day one when this controversy was planted in the house, in the house by that amendment. We clearly was against it. We clearly expressed our disbelief in it. And the president, at the end of the day, had proven some of us right. Yes, direct primaries was only an amendment proposed when we were considering the clause by clause consideration of the report from the Electoral Committee, which I'm a ranking member. It wasn't part of any of the processes until we got to almost the final stage, because close-to-close -close consideration of any report leads to third reading, which is the final stage. And so the amendment came at that point. And so when public hearings were done, uh, opinions were expressed, uh, uh, oppositions were uh, accommodated you know, to certain provisions and all that, in shaping the bill, we didn't have any controversy as to the provision of parties organizing their primaries. And so some of us felt that it was not necessary at that time. It was not properly articulated, not properly considered, and so it was not good enough to go. But of course, you know, in democracy, a minority will have their say, a majority will have their way. Again, it was not an issue of majority party versus minority party. It was a bipartisan acceptance or opposition. So it was not an issue between the PDP and the APC or you know other parties. There are members of APC in the House who didn't believe in it, who opposed it. There were members of PDP in the House who also felt it's good enough, you know, and all that. But the circumstances in which that amendment was moved, seconded, and then considered as passed was not transparent enough. And so most of us, even within uh, the assembly, opposed it and had continued to oppose it until when Mr. President, you know, would tell his assent. Now what are we to do? For some of us, the issue of overriding the virtue of Mr. President is not realizable. That's the truth of the matter. It's not. You don't have that kind of night assembly. You don't have that kind of leadership. So there's no pretense about it. Of course, if it were an issue that the minority party, particularly the PDP, held strongly about, maybe 
would have tried to lobby people in the majority party to see how we can override the veto of Mr. President. But as far as we are concerned, it's not one of the naughty issues that we need to treat. So we are largely not disturbed about, you know, trying to push to override the veto of Mr. President. For some of us, we concur with Mr. President as to deleting that clause, that provision. Mm -hmm. It's premature in our democracy to tie down the parties to one form of uh, conducting primaries. And so I think that uh, the assembly will have no choice but to delete it. And we are ready to push that and realize it so that Mr. President will have ample time to assign to it. Now that particularly when he has spoken to Nigerians, that once that is taken off, he is going to ascend. We need this law for a more transparent, more credible you know, electoral process. So that's more important than how the parties select or nominate their candidates. But uh, so some observers believe that the primaries will give uh, the, the participants opportunity to express themselves you know, as against your notion about it, why the president declined an asset? That is your opinion. You are not a practicing politician, so you may not know the much I know about direct primaries. The truth of the matter is that if you want to express your ambition, there are so many ways in which you express your ambition. Expressing ambition is not only by direct primaries. If you want to express your ambition to contest anything at all, the first thing is to indicate your interest. The other thing is to comply with the rules of the party. First, the party will sell nomination forms or forms of intent. Did you buy? If they say, come and pay one billion to uh, buy a nomination form. If you don't have the one billion, your interest will die from that point. <laughs> so it's not about direct primaries. You have to pass the various criteria, orders that will be set by the party before you even now get to the point of participating in primaries, be it direct, indirect, or consensus. You know, so I think it's not about expressing uh, one's ambition. It's about the processes leading to nominating a candidate. And even when you talk about indirect primaries, indirect primaries has an element of direct in it. Uh, because you have ad hoc delegates that are elected through direct elections. Take for example, in most of the elections, every ward nominates elects three, three delegates. Those delegates contest election where they are voted for. And by the cast of votes, of the registered members of the party at that ward, the three highest vote scholars are considered as being elected to represent that ward as ad hoc delegates in any primaries that is going to hold. And so that is direct content of a direct primaries. Before you now come back to the delegate stage at either local government level or state level or at the national level. You know, so indirect has an element of direct and indirect, you know, primaries. But if you're talking about direct, you're only talking about people going to their wards, queue behind whoever they want, or cast votes for whoever they want. But that process is even easier to be manipulated because most of the times people sit in the cozy of their houses, write results if they have access to those who control the system. And they announced their results, and that is all. And that was what you saw in Anambra, where a governorship candidate had over 300 and something thousand votes. And on the day of the general election, it was like all those 300 and something thousand voters traveled away or decided not to come and cast their votes, or they were all had COVID and died, or something else happened. And so those votes were not casted. That is direct primaries we're talking about. You know. So if you want to be governor and 300 plus people elected you in direct primaries, 
those are the first votes you are going to get in the general election before you now talk about other votes that you are going to galvanize. There is no way you nominate a candidate that in the general election you abandon that candidate. It's not possible. You know, so I can tell you that maybe the worst form, as we are today, the worst form of conducting primaries is even the direct primaries because of our lack of transparency. Sir, former President uh, Gulo Dunant has been touted as uh, one of the contenders for 2023, sir. One, do you uh, support this move? And two, how realistic could such be? I'm also touted as a senatorial aspirant in a senatorial district. But I've never told anybody that I'm contesting. <laughs> so, in the same way, I, I don't think that Good Lord President, Good Lord has told anybody he wants to be president again. But people are at liberty to say whatever they want to say. What I can tell you is that if people are saying so about someone, then what you should know is that a person is eminently qualified for that office. There are things they see, there are qualities they see in such a person that makes them have that belief that if this person were my leader, I would have loved, you know, or things would have been better. I think that's... The, so until Mr. President, you know, uh, openly tell us that he's interested, he wants to rule Nigeria again, then we we'll take a proper decision. I, I believe you are close to the former president. You know, but why not? Told me anything about it. He's from Bayasa. Today, uh, are all Nigerians not uh, clamoring, not appreciating that uh, they regretted, you know, whatever that happened to him when he was in power. Today is a man celebrated in Nigeria, West Africa, Africa, and across the globe. And I tell you, if you have that opportunity to appear with Mr. President in any part of the world, you'll be amazed the kind of reception, the kind of joy in the hearts of the people, the way people want to touch and feel, is this President good luck? You know. And that caused to uh, be a disconcert in one of uh, his uh, presentations far away in the United States of America. And the way the people were celebrating him, you know, because we came from the same place, we've worked together, we know ourselves very well. You know, I just stood at a corner watching with amazement the way he was being celebrated. I can tell you that President Goodluck's profile is rising. He does not really need to be president again in this country to be what he will be tomorrow. He has become a world figure. The world is celebrating him. And for some of us, we are very happy that an Izzo man can be so respected across the globe. So, uh, in essence, uh, no, going for the post for the second time is uh, not advisable. But I can tell you that in four years, there's nothing you can amend in this country. President Buhari and APC has brought down this country to such an extent that even eight years cannot repair this country. So if you have a rising profile, even after office to this extent, why do you go and uh, labor yourself? Uh, let's look at the literary voting as a you know, critical means of uh, guiding the electoral process. And let's from has been a uh, fair and fair election has been a big issue in this country. So the introduction of uh, literary voting as we had in Anambra, people feel uh, is the way forward. How do you re uh, realize that the free fair and free election in 23? Are we adopting electronic voting? No, I think, uh, let me correct you, uh, Nigeria is not <coughs> doing any electronic voting yet. That has not happened. There are no laws to that effect. Where Nigeria is today is electronic transmission of results. That's where we are. That you don't need to carry results in papers traveling from one ward to another, one unit to another, one local government to another, one state to another, you know, to Abuja. That is what we are trying to eliminate, or INEC is trying to eliminate. 
what INEC is trying to do and what this law is about to treat and cure is that after your voting, the result will be transmitted to the center, wherever it will be collated, be it at the world headquarter, be it at the local government headquarter, be it at the state headquarter, be it at Abuja, the national headquarter. So the same result will simultaneously be received and be appearing in all the collation desks. So you won't have that opportunity to manipulate figures from one point to the other. That is what we are trying to kill by this amendment, which is one of the germane issues that will bring about transparency. Because most of the times, this movement of results causes change of figures. And once that happens, those who lost elections at the unit may become the winners at the world, or may become the winners at the local government level. We want to make sure that that does not happen anymore. You know. But over time, we are sure that we will get to electronic voting, which is the ultimate that all of us expect that should happen. All right, sir. <coughs> um, away from national issues, um, let's go to your own state by yourself. You are a strong uh, supporter of the governor. In less than a month from now, he'll be two years in office. How would you assess his administration in two years? He's done very well. A number of times I've gone with him to inspect ongoing projects. And uh, it's uh, quite encouraging, considering the lean financial situation this country is going through. I'm sure that he has a lot, 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 lot of projects to showcase in his second anniversary. And so there will be a lot of commissioning of projects that's going to take place. And we all join him. Again, it's not just projects. A peaceful atmosphere is very, very important. Today, if you talk to the opposition parties in the state, all Bayersans can travel to Bayersa without any fear of molestation or harassment or some kind of tension or, you know, aggression that they will be confronted with when they go to their state. So, indigenous of Bayasa, no matter the party, the political divide you belong to, travel to the state, spend their time with their families, their loved ones, with their party members, you know, without any fear. And that is the most important thing. In terms of security, yes, there is no security situation is, that is perfect across the globe. But I think Bayasa still remains one of the least insecure states. You know, and we're happy about it. And the governor is always extending hands of fellowship to the opposition to all biasers, be you a politician or a non-politician. Biasa is for all, and we all need to come together by his words to collectively contribute to the development of the state. And so, he's accommodative, he has a peaceful disposition, and a loving man that attracts all and sundry, you know, to come and join him in the development of the state. Let me take it from the last time, but a lovely man, um, just on Sunday, the governor settled his political rift with um, his kinsman, Chief Timia Laibi. What do you make of that reconciliation? It was long expected. The governor himself had made a lot of efforts to ensure that they come together in building his government and biasa. And we're all happy to see this realized. I want to use this opportunity to congratulate him. Congratulate Chief Timia Laibe as well. Congratulate uh, Governor Wiki and others from Bayosa, from his local government. Also congratulate uh, people like uh, Engineer Gesi Asamwe, Ulis Kevin Nambo and others. Including uh, Chief King Tona, King Tona and all of them who have worked tirelessly to ensure 
that this unity was realized. And I think it's good for Bayosa. It's good for the prosperity government. It's good for development and progress of our state. Honourable sir, there is um, some level of agitation in your senatorial zone concerning the issue of zoning. Um, you are a stakeholder. Where do you stand? Well, uh, like I said earlier, you know, once elections are close, you hear all kinds of stories, all kinds of agitations will come. And of course, that is the way you hear some uh, hidden issues. Uh, you get the minds of people and then you also take a step to resolve such issues and then bring about peace and unity in the state. For us in uh, the Bayasa West Natural District, where two local governments that make up the federal constituency as well as the senatorial district. So if one takes Senate, the other takes us of reps. Interestingly, we have a document that is signed by all parties. It's not as if it's just a verbal discussion, no. A document that was appended to, not only by a party, by all the parties, you know, and so that decision certainly is going to stand. And that is where, you know, as a representative of the people, whatever the people agrees that is good for them, that they have reduced to paper and pen, that's where I stand, even though I was not in some of those meetings. But that is the decision of my people. And they are the people I represent. And so that is the decision that I stand with. Right, sir. Wouldn't that decision of the agreement of your people, wouldn't it have been altered if Perimuboe Baby had won the last senatorial ele by election? Well, I, 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 if he had won, again, you are saying if he had won, he didn't win. Perimuboe Baby is not a little figure in politics that you can show her side. He's a leader in the senatorial district. He's a respected politician in the senatorial district. And so if a baby is contesting election, you know that one respected, important senior politician is running an election. But because he came against the tide, like the job people will say, we from his own local government disowned him and everybody disowned him. And that was the result you saw. Sometimes I hear people talk about a baby. Even within the PDP, when we conducted primaries, when the present deputy governor was going to hold forth for the present, for the former governor who is now a senator, that primary was contested by two Sagbama people because the Senate was made for Sagbama local government, while the House of Reps was for Kilimo local government. It will surprise you to know that Sagbama indigent contested the primaries with me. <laughs> so before a baby, somebody had done, you know, something, and similar to it, and the Sabama people rejected him. The Sabama people rejected him. In fact, the former governor at the venue of the primaries had to sit down with him, tell him that what he was doing was wrong, and that I should, uh, you know, uh, sort him out. So that, you know, uh, a Clement will have their position. So these are things that, you know, that will not scuttle the agreement that we have. That will not, you know. And as far as the people are concerned, if anybody, for any reason, did that, 
he did that, you know, by his own volition and not in agreement with the people. And so if any other individual, no matter who you are, if you feel that that is a good step to take, it's you that will be risking <laughs> you know, your integrity. Because those who tried it, maybe must have uh, had some bruises. If you ask them, they may have a story to tell you. So if you feel that that's good enough, that's a good way to go, well, of course. They say the way you make your bed, you lie on it, isn't it? So for me, for me and for our people, that understanding will bring about unity, peace and progress. It will promote love between the two local governments. And for us who are going towards retirement, you know, we will always keep it and hand it over to the young ones who will take over from us. Right, you alluded to the speculations concerning your political future. You are a second time member of the House of Reps, third time member of the House of Reps. Are you contesting the 2023 senatorial election or are you going back to the House of Reps? First, I'm not going back to the House of Reps because my local government do not qualify again to run for that position. One. Two, whether I will be contesting, I think it's not a question I can tell you that I'm contesting. In politics, you just don't contest elections. You have to consult. Like the governor will say, consult your stakeholders and ensure that you are sure of what you are doing before you throw your heart into the ring. I'm not someone who just wake up to contest elections. I've contested several elections, won a number of them, lost some, you know. So it's not easy to just say, I'm contesting an election. You have to check the system properly, see if the direction is clear. Sometimes even ask yourself if it is necessary. If it is necessary. It's not easy to deliver service. So if you consider some elections not necessary, you don't need to force yourself into it. So a lot of people say, oh, yes, of course. Haven't been in the House of Reps a third time. Haven't gotten to a point where I cannot come back to the House of Reps anymore. And knowing my pedigree, the expectation of a lot of people is that, yes, you can be promoted. They have entitlement to that opinion. But as to whether I will or not, for now, I'm not too sure about that decision yet. Okay, we're gradually rounding up, sir. Um, what's your relationship with your ex-wife boss, former Governor Dixon? Very good, yeah. We are all in the National Assembly. We are all serving our people. And we are doing our best to ensure that our people benefit again from our service in the National Assembly. So we are. We are not just political uh, boss and colleagues as it is. We are also father-in-law and son-in-law. So you should know that that will make the relationship even a lot more tighter and more cordial. Final note, sir. Um, something happened recently. Um, one of your constituents tackled you on Facebook um, to say that you should copy what your other colleagues are doing in other constituencies in Bayelsa State. And then you asked him what exactly are they doing so that you can learn. And then he told you what they were doing. And you said you have done those things in the past. Now, it's uh, noticed that you are silent with your interventions for your constituents. Why are you doing things in secrecy? <laughs> well, you see, anybody who says, learn from 
so and so person is helping you, he loves you, he wants you to succeed. So as far as I'm concerned, maybe I was not doing enough and he wanted me to succeed. And he saw examples that I need to copy and follow. And I'm ready at any given time, you know, to follow such advice so that I can also succeed. I can do better than, you know, what I've done or I've been doing. Again, uh, yes, when you say publicity, maybe some of us are not uh, the Facebook tigers like others. Uh, I'm not a social media man. So I'm sure a lot of people could be saying a lot of things in the social media. Most, I don't even, I don't even know how I came to see that one. <laughs> you know, once in a while, even in three months, maybe I'll just be going through some. I just can't tell how I stumbled on that one. And it was a fine interaction. It was quite uh, heartwarming, you know. But uh, let me quick to tell you that today is my apostle. I've encountered uh, so many of such you know, challenges. And what I do is, if I know the platforms on which you operate, I send all my activities to you. Uh, by the time you get my news, my actions, my trainings, my projects and all that, eventually you become my apostle. So that itself is one device God has used for me to continue to attract more apostles, you know, that will carry my message. Today, he carries my message as if, you know, when we started that interaction, there were two enemies that were conversing. You know. So what I can tell you is, other than social media, I hardly can say that uh, most of my co colleagues are uh, uh, more publicity oriented than me. I hardly can say that. But you see, no matter how many times you watch a program, if you are not regularly watching it, there is a propensity for you to forget that sometime ago I came across this. Again, in social media, has taken some of our youths away from the digital or regular electronic news. You know, some of them don't, I don't think that they even watch television. All what they are entangled with is Facebook or this or that, you know. And so, if you are not within that digital framework and find yourself in such platforms, they may not even see what you are doing. Other than that, I think I'm also tended to know or think that it depends on what platform you are. Maybe if I'm not linked to you, I may not see the things that you post in your platform. Maybe for those who are gurus in it, they have a way of traversing all platforms and see all things that are posted in every platform. But for some of us, we may scroll down our Facebook and not see most of the things that, uh, <laughs> you know. And after a while, you are a busy person. You have a lot of things to do. A lot, lot, a lot, lot, lot of things to do. You know, so when you go to WhatsApp and people want you to, from morning till night, want to, to be on WhatsApp, then what time do you have for the responsibilities for which they elected you to? You know, people want you to be on the phone, picking their phone calls and calling them back, you know, the, through the day. What time do you have to do your work? You know, but when you tell them all this, they won't understand. They just feel that any time they pick their phone and call you, you are there to pick it. You are there to respond. It's not possible. You know, sometimes we take time to explain to them that this is not possible. But... You know, they will never see it the way, you know, uh, uh, you are explaining it. So, I don't think that I'm a media shy or social media shy person. 
but I have my limitations. And then all this has to do with even the volume of pocket that you have. Of course, you know for you to run the news on TV, you know how much money that you are going to spend. Uh, maybe the social media is maybe a lot cheaper, all that. Like my former governor will say, what was that thing he said? I will call those boys for you. Who are those? Data boys or something. <laughs> you know. Even the data boys requires money for, that. Money for data. <laughs> you know, you just don't call them up. You know, you know. So that's the situation. But as far as I'm concerned, it's not always also that you have to blow your trumpet. It's not always. I'm one person who commissions my projects. In the next few weeks, maybe end of January or first week of February, We'll be commissioning four projects again. You know, the civic hall in uh, Alebri in the Kremlin local government area, six classrooms uh, uh, building just completed in uh, Bedebri, uh, three classrooms and offices renovated in uh, Sagbama School 2, and then seven classrooms renovated and uh, walkway and uh, conveniences in Isoni in Sagbama local government. We are going to commission all this. Maybe we are going to also see the road networks in Tolibini after all that commissioning. You know. And then we are doing jetties. We are taking two jetties at the same time in the Kremlin local government. The main community civic center jetty. And then the INEC waterfront, where materials are always distributed you know, to the riverland communities you know, in every election. You know. So for us, we are also gradually moving from this kind of empowerment that we are not seeing results, results to some legacy and enduring projects that over time people can make reference to you that it is during this person's time in the House of Reps, in the National Assembly, that this was constructed. You know, your children will eventually come and be proud that their father did this for one or two communities. I think that's where we are going. All right, Honorable. Um, we just hope that um, we're part of those uh, commissioning going forward. We we'll invite you. We want to thank you so much, Honorable Fred, again thank for your valuable time that you have spent with us. God bless you. Thank, thank you, sir.